right, I think we are good to get started. People will kind of slowly come in, I think, throughout this, but, uh, you know, end of the day for East Coast, and we'll try and get y'all started and ready to go. Um, again, thank you for joining us. My name is Andrew Doyle. I am the coordinator of recreation at Southern New Hampshire University. And I am uh, Chris Kroom. I am the director of the Trumbull Clock Center at Denison University. I uh, see I'm already getting asked about a new background, so <laughs> Let's see if I could stump some people, I suppose. All right, we'll let Chris get that set up. Um, we wanted to start off today, just do a little poll, see what people are focusing on. I think we're at a point, or maybe a week or so, a couple weeks into shifting gears. I know a lot of people spent the first month or so, nice background, Chris, um, of, you know, figuring out programming, what are we going to do, how are we dealing with this, and I'm, I'm hoping most people are starting to shift gears and focusing on reopening, looking, the, looking at the fall. Um, so at this point, we're going to do a little poll with the help of, um, Megan at HQ, I think. I'm not exactly sure. Here we go. So you should have a poll popping up on your screen. If you want to take a look at that, this is going to hopefully, you know, help bring up some ideas of what we're going to talk about, see the consensus of the group of where you're focusing. Um, so just take a minute and, uh, let us know what you think. We'll give you a little bit longer. It's a pretty short poll, but like 15, 20 more seconds, just in case. And then we'll share the results and then we'll kind of jump right in. Um, as we wait, we have a couple ground rules that if you've been here before, you should know them. Um, Chris, correct me if I miss any. First one is stay positive. You know, we want to find solutions and not get stuck on the problem. Um, focus on the students. That's why a lot of us are here in our jobs. Uh, we want to provide those best opportunities and see what we can do to, you know, make the best out of the situation, whether we're open in the fall or not. Um, Chris, what am I forgetting? I know we have a third one. Third ground rule. Stay positive. Focus on solutions. Well, we'll if we remember it, we'll mention it, but, you know, just stay positive and let's uh, focus on solutions, not the problems. All right. <laughs> Megan, are we able to share those results? Here we go. Awesome. That's cool just saying something and has it pops up on screen. I feel like I'm in a sci-fi movie. All right. So the number one right now, what is your priority in terms of returning to work? Uh, two answers there. 77% of people focusing on facilities, which I think makes sense. Most states are looking towards opening up and trying to figure that out right now. So that makes sense that a lot of people are looking towards that. And that kind of continues into the second question of what are you most concerned about? 48% um, people focusing on how do they reopen their fitness facilities? And then after that, competitive sports. Um, and we actually had some others down there. So if you voted other, uh, if you are willing to share, feel free to throw that in the chat and we can kind of talk about that if it comes up. And then number three, we have which area do you believe need the most creative solutions in terms of finances? Competitive sports came away at number one. Um, fitness facilities, number two. That's a big topic for everything right now. And then from there, uh, group fitness and then aquatics and other. And again, feel free to show it, throw in your other in the chat. All right. Typically, we have some prepared questions, but we're going to kind of leave this up to the group to guide the conversation. We already have a question in the chat from Max. Um, his question is, hi, does anyone oversee the physical education program at their institution that is an academic requirement? Do we have anyone here? that is overseeing that. I know we don't. Got some more people popping in the chat. Thank you for joining us. All right, we'll come back to that if anyone answers that, Max. Um, a lot of people are worried about staffing. Um, in terms of staffing, I'm assuming most people are concerned with, is it student staff? If, uh, if, if that's your concern, feel free to throw a thumbs up or a, a yes, or whatever it's gotta be. Chris, what are your uh, plans for student staffing if you started to think about that? Yeah, you know, really we've actually started, you know, creating our kind of re-entry plan, um, you know, getting that submitted up to our board of trustees and everything. So it's kind of actually pertinent, you know, 
really worried about staffing and what that looks like. You know, we just don't know what our final, you know, number one, what our final numbers are going to look like, you know, of incoming students and returning students coming back to campus. You know, we really haven't decided on a format for our, what our semesters are going to look like yet. So that really helps inform, you know, a lot of our staffing models. So for me, it's really kind of sitting and making out, you know, two to three different sets of plans of schedules just based on, you know, what I think is going to happen. And I could be completely wrong. and I'd have to make a fourth one, you know, tomorrow if you know if need be but you know really it's about trying to keep our students safe and healthy while they're up there in the chairs and what does that look like um, so for us you know we've been coming up following CDC guidelines state of Ohio guidelines um, you know, and really for us especially in aquatics you know USA Swimming actually did a great job and put out a lot of guidelines for what staffing and stuff like that should look like and how we can take care of our staff uh, but it's really the unknown and really the unexpectedness of, or, you know, or the, you know, the unknown and not, you know, really just kind of trying to wing it and figure out exactly how we're going to keep our folks safe. So. We're in a, a similar situation. We are supposed to make the call on if we are opening in the fall um, next week on Monday. So I've been kind of in a holding pattern in New Hampshire. We are yet to be cleared or even given guidelines of, what our fitness facilities uh, expectations or rec requirements, recommendations, um, what they're supposed to be when we reopen. So we're kind of in a holding pattern and I've just been tracking things that have been going on around us with using the uh, Google Doc that is set up in the Nursing Connect community and seeing what other schools are doing, what other states are doing, just tracking those, um, checking out CDC guidelines when they come out. That way, when we do reopen, we can kind of set our expectations, not just off the state requirements or our institution's requirements, but also like what the standard is across the industry. Um, but at the same point, we've I've been more focused in on if we are virtual, or remote again in the fall. Um, how do we plan for that? Uh, because I got the okay from our HR department that we are going to have student staff if we need it this past fall, uh, past spring, when we went online, we weren't allowed to. Um, and if anyone else has some staffing ideas, solutions, problems, throw them in the chat. Uh, feel free that it's not just Chris and I talking the whole time. I don't think anybody wants that, especially us. Um, but we've been focused on what can we do? What kind of remote jobs can we give students if we are remote again in the fall? Like being creative, finding those things. Um, and that's kind of where we've been spending the majority of our time. Yeah, and I think for, again, for us too, tagging off of that is, you know, we've really been focused on how do we even train, how do we get as much of our training done virtually ahead of time? And how do we improve that process that we've had in place to train them as much virtually so that we can eliminate as much contact? You know, a lot of the training that we all do for just the different, you know, areas of recreation there's, it's very hard to socially distance when you're doing trainings, you know, and especially with your, your safety trainings, you know, first aid, CPR, things like that, almost impossible. So we try to get as, we're trying to get as much done and figure out new processes to get that accomplished as well so that we can keep our students, again, as safe as we possibly can. All right. So I, since facilities and fitness facilities specifically were the biggest concern from that poll, um, I'm hoping someone has some problems or ideas or solutions. Um, if you want to throw those in the chat, feel free to jump, jump in, unmute yourself and, and, you know, we can start a conversation there. Uh, we have a comment June 10th. A lot of people are opening up pretty soon, you know, staff trainings um, on Friday, some people at uh, U Central Arkansas opening on Monday. So, you know, a lot of people are already there. So if you are in the middle of or about to open or have already opened, um, if you are willing to, uh, you know, maybe talk about that process you went through, even if it's just, you know, Cliff Notes version, um, just trying to help people that are about to go into that process or are currently going through it, that might be helpful. Matt's got a good question. Hey, Matt, would you mind just jumping on and asking that question to the entire group? Yeah, so I was on a call with one of our, I'm sure every school has like eight different planning committees or subgroups or whatever, task force, whatever you want to call it. And one thing that came up, and it was a bunch of us who oversee student workers, it's like, what are they going to be allowed to do? Because I feel like at this point, we kind of understand the parameters, like we might need to take temperatures, we might need to do questionnaires. But I know at our school, um, we're kind of transitioning into it, but like we're not exactly the most student 
focused school. And so my concern is that they're only going to want professional staff to do those things. And I'm like, well, as a, as a small staff as it is, like you just want me to park at the fitness center all day and then do club sports and all the other stuff I got to do too. So again, I don't know if anybody has an answer, but I was just curious to see if anybody's made decisions on what students are going to do specifically in the fitness center. This is Anthony from uh, University of Central Arkansas. Um, so first of all, we are taking a lot of our guidance from our Department of Health. They actually sent out a directive, and I'll throw that in there here in a minute. And then, of course, we're taking guidance that the university is also putting out. Um, we will have student workers that will take temperatures, but the requirement is only temperatures of, you know, us and or other student workers that come in because that is a directive. We asked our clinic uh, doc if we should take temperatures of all the patrons and he said no that is not recommended. Uh, this is Myla Paget, and I am at USC Aiken. And so this will just show you the contrast. So ours is the other way. Our students will be taking temperatures and they will be doing the questionnaire and we are to do that with every person that open, like comes into our facility. So you just have two universities that have totally different protocols. And I think that's very common right now because we're all just trying to start following the guidelines the best that we can and more than likely I feel that some things are probably going to change once some of us get into the trenches. Um, but yeah, our students will be doing all that piece. We are, we don't typically have professional staff here. All hours were open and we are going to do that for the first three weeks that we are open. So we don't want to have just our students by themselves here, at least for the initial part of it. So we did rearrange professional staff schedules, so somebody is here. So I'm gonna caveat off of what uh, Mala said. Same thing, we're shortening our hours and we're gonna be within the window of time that professional will staff be here. We're not opening up on weekends um, right now. Um, and so we feel like it is very important to have the big dog, so to speak, around that can answer or deal with any of these situations so we don't put a student worker uh, in a predicament like this. Hi, this is Jeremy Fritz at Christopher Newport University. Um, it sounds like from our initiatives, from our kind of upper cabinet, it sounds like we're going to kind of fall somewhere in between. Um, it doesn't sound like they're going to want us to kind of have our student staff taking temperatures, but just kind of asking all the patrons that are coming in, like, have they been sick lately? How are they feeling? Um, so it's almost kind of like a self-reporting. So I feel like it kind of falls in between, um, say, Anthony and Myla. Um, but who knows, that could change in the next two weeks. But that's sounding like, that's sound, as of right now, that kind of sounds like where we're probably going to end up. Uh, Sean Rutherford at Adelphi University in New York, and we're a lot different than what a lot of people do. I don't know if it's just because of the area we're in, but our school is actually um, teaming up with Northwell Health and a lot of our health administration and nursing schools. We're actually testing. Apparently, the president wants um, everyone to be on campus. You have to be tested in order to be on campus, and they're going to do the testing, so we don't have to worry about questionnaires, taking temperatures, because they're not letting anybody on campus first who isn't gonna be tested and then they're gonna have a dorm separately not housed as like a quarantine zone. <clears throat> so we've talked about that with like students doing the things or whatever, but for us, it's not gonna necessarily be necessary because all the testing and contact tracing and all that stuff is gonna be done. Um, they said they're talking about doing testing on like a weekly or bi-weekly basis with people who come on and off campus. So that's uh, obviously a lot different than some of the other schools in more rural areas is probably because we're 20 minutes from Manhattan. But uh, yeah, just another thing to think about. If any schools are partnered or have any health programs, just kind of maybe check and see if they have any plans about partnering with external health organizations and seeing what they're doing. How many tests is that looking like 
<laughs> it's it's going to be a, it's a lot. They're doing they're not it's not limited. To just, the talk is uh, what they're proposing is not just for students. It's students, staff, faculty, everything tested on a um, consist. I I don't know what they said. They're not letting us know what consistent means. If it's weekly, if it's biweekly, if it's monthly. But we're a large commuter school as well. So it's got to be semi-regular because even if you're testing people, all right, you know, the people on campus are maybe all right. But, you know, once these commuters, we're like 50% commuter, you know, once people leave campus, you don't know who they're um, in contact with and stuff like that, which is why they're also trying to get, they said three to four contact tracers as well. Yeah. And I think that piggybacks off of a lot of us that are, you know, part of athletic departments as well with, you know, maybe visiting teams, what does sport look like when that kind of, you know, when we return to campus, if, if that is a thing, how are we going to get that kind of, you know, testing, tracing, that kind of stuff done as well. So. There are a lot of questions going on about temperatures in the chat. I know Mark asked originally like, why are we doing it if you know it's not always the the key symptom essentially um we are doing that just for professional staff that are essential workers on our campus right now and their reason they're doing it is just to be better safe than sorry um you know i think the threshold for like a high temperature is like anything over 100 or 101 um, because people's temperatures obviously it could be lower or higher naturally um and it's just better safe than sorry, making sure that you better cover themselves and, and get somebody out of there that maybe didn't have it than miss it and someone who did. Um, I'm also seeing questions about PPEs, um, who's ordering them. From my recollection or my understanding here is that the university is gonna be in charge of distributing that. It's not gonna be up to individual departments uh, free for all essentially. It's gonna be, there's gonna be a process where we all work collaboratively and hopefully get the right amount. Um, we're a little bit further away from that as we are remote through at least August 15th. Um, but that's, we're already getting those policies and procedures in place. Yeah, I'd echo that as well. We've, you know, our university is, you know, really taking charge of that bulk purchasing of PPE, masks, hand sanitizer, Lysol wipes, you know, so that they can get number one, the best deal, but then also be able to get enough for the entirety of campus and make sure that it's the right stuff as well. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know Sean just mentioned something about shields at desks. Um, going back to the, uh, the point of fitness facilities, are people considering or have they put up um, those plexiglass barriers between cardio machines? I know I've seen that as a recommendation or a possible procedure is anyone doing that i'm just asking because I, i'm curious we're starting to talk about that a little bit and if that's what people are doing then i think we're going to try and do it as well so we got approval since i said the uh shields or whatever we got approval to put up those plexiglass shields like you would see in uh stores or whatnot just for desk areas so um you know where you swipe people in the fitness center lobby etc we don't know if we're gonna get it approved to be put in between every cardio machine. So our other thought was maybe <clears throat> roping off every second or third cardio machine. So say we have 10 cardio machines, you just have the first one, the fifth one in the middle, and then the last one open, and then maybe rotate them on a um, daily or weekly basis, like maybe number them odds and evens and then swap them every day or every two days. And kind of we were thinking about doing some stuff like that to keep people away. Um, Cause we also, said with cardio it's got to be a little bit more than six feet because people are breathing heavier and deeper so the just six feet six foot rule might not be enough so that's why we thought of maybe doing even like every like second or third machine as well nice and then Mila also mentioned in the chat that we are having everyone other every other machine not in use due to social distancing but not using plexiglass i think that's going to be a common you know way to do it um i saw a question about masks during exercise uh michael thomas do you mind you know unmuting and asking that to the group sure um are you guys making masks mandatory during all of your workouts the whole entire time while they're in the gym or facility a lot of no's in the group you know that was one of the first questions i had as we started to go through this um 
in New Hampshire. Right now, small group training is allowed in one-on-one -on -one training, but general fitness facilities are still meant to be closed. And the rule right now is you have to wear it whenever you are in that building, except when you're working out. So if you start doing jumping jacks, you can take it off. And then as soon as you stop, got to put it right back on. I'm seeing a lot of head nods. So that be, might be kind of common. So that might be the way to go. Okay, my next question is uh, for spotters. Are you allowing spotters in the gym for your patrons, um, especially with heavy lifting? Because I know, at least in Berea, we have some people who think they're Olympic lifters, but they're really not. They need a spotter to <laughs> make sure they have that safety. Sure. We haven't gotten that far in the conversation yet. We're kind of holding off on the specifics of that until, you know, we know where we're going to be. Um, but hopefully some other people have answers. Anthony at Central Arkansas. Nope, no signs to say no spotting. Um, I'll kind of broaden this question a little bit. So for free weight use, what are people doing? I know a couple weeks ago that was a big topic, at least up around here, of if you're allowing it. Um, Oop, just seeing Virginia so removing weights that okay so just no weights that were require spotting okay uh, Karen removing all benches no spotting so these people that are removing the benches um, are you allowing free weights still Yes. All right. So how are you managing that? I know some people have talked about they had to have a specific area that like once you use a free weight, it gets dropped off in the, the dirty weight zone. Someone wipes it down and puts it back for use. Um, Anthony, I know you're talking a lot, but if, if you didn't mind, you know, filling us in on your plan there, that'd be helpful. No. Oh, okay. Uh, first and foremost. So, you know, since we open, we will have student workers here and they are literally there one for safety of course but two is to clean to clean to clean to clean that is what they are supposed to do um once somebody gets off the machine puts a weight down they're told to immediately go there and they're going to clean that machine i've also heard on a few other groups uh, especially like with cardio machines or with like a selectorized type uh, weight machines is people are putting off like um like uh green red cards and green needs to be cleaned and then the patrons are requested to do or told to do is when they get off the machine to flip that card on that machine over to red. Jeremy just brought up a good point. Um, I know some people have mentioned, um, and first, Anthony, thank you for speaking up. Um, Jeremy was saying that we are going to have difficulty moving machines and weights since we don't have a lot of room or anywhere to move them. Um, that's a similar situation that we're in at SNHU. Who is in a similar situation that may have a solution or has found a solution that does not work? I'm seeing a lot of no ideas. So at Berea, we moved our benches to our basketball court since we're not allowing basketball at this moment. Um, that is a very temporary solution to band-aid because eventually the gym will be open and we are not sure what we do after that. Sure, that makes sense. Moving to basketball courts, things like that, that won't get used for, you know, team sports for the time being is a good opportunity. No storage space is definitely a problem, even when there's not a pandemic or virus going around. And yeah, Anthony makes a good point. Don't forget about those heavy machines on wood courts. Probably you know, got to be careful about that, you know, especially right now, you know, I know we're getting our courts refinished since we're shut down. Would hate to do that to our pretty brand new courts with that brand new finish, so. All right. Any other questions about like facilities or what issues are people coming across? I can see basketball coaches not being happy with that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen a happy coach. So, fair. Um, what are people doing that have hand, had uh, hand readers or biometric access? Is anyone on that on this call that has that in their facility? We don't. We um, just still old school take IDs. It's real fancy. Um, we're working on getting that, but. Um, Central Arkansas turning off and putting them down. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're in the same boat as you. We use just our old school swipe cards. Actually, we did just upgrade their tap card now, so you just have to tap it. But 
still old school. Side gig to that. So if you guys know like your little pickup sticks for your trash, we got a couple of those at the counter where we're going to have IDs. So if so, we have to like actually handle a card, we're actually going to take it and hold it with that and then input their information. That's a good solution. Another one I've heard before is if you have a desk or area that's big enough, kind of like the, the no contact pickup that if you're doing, you know, pickup from a restaurant where they leave it on a table, you swipe it, they give them the thumbs up, they can go and add, like when they're going to come back, you know, having something on the floor where they can stand, asking their name and, and going from there, kind of putting it down and backing up. Not the most efficient system, but if it's the only thing that can keep those social distancing guidelines, then you got to do it. Um, capacity, Milo saying, our capacity is 32 in our fitness area. We are giving everyone their own disinfectant bottle and towel upon entry with directions on the bottle. Disinfect the bottle when it is returned. That is a good idea. That's one of the big questions of how do we make sure everyone has access to it? You know, mm -hmm. we want to put it out there and make it easy for everyone to get the tools. Um, Milo, are you still having staff go around and cleaning and wiping down after everyone's anyway? Yes, we will. Um, we're actually opening shorter times and then we're having a deep cleaning and closing for a minute not a minute literally an hour and a half and then reopening so we're doing that all day um, but we're going to try this everybody get their own bottle to hopefully so they we're calling it shared responsibility that people understand that it really is their personal responsibility to, to disinfect before and after and then we will do our best to keep up, but we only have two students, and we increase, we only had one student employee on every hour. So now we have to have two for the screening, but one student cannot do all of that cleaning after every single person. Mm -hmm. So that's, we're gonna try that and hopefully it works and we'll see where it goes from there. Thank you. Um, Milo, sorry, can you, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead, Chris. I say, like Jamie had one question, I think kind of to add to that, uh, asking, uh, is the deep clean that you're talking about done in the middle of the day, end of the day, both? So what we're doing is we're opening from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., closing, cleaning for how, we don't know how long it's going to take. So we have an hour and a half blocked off. We reopen at 1130 till 2, close, clean, reopen at 430 till 7 close clean that's going to be our schedule right now and the reason we're doing these in the guidelines for south carolina that was another piece like you had to deep clean every two hours well how do you do that and what does that mean it's it's vague so you have to decide what that means so we just we limited our hours that'll help with our budget we're not open on the weekends so that's kind of where we're starting with what we're calling phase one. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Matt just put a comment or a question in the chat about electrostatic disinfecting sprayers or foggers or whatever you want to call them. Is anyone using those? I know we just started talking about them as a possibility here um, to kind of do that same, you know, deep clean guidelines that Mila just talked about. Um, some people are looking into them. A lot of people want them, I think. I mean, they just look cool to walk around fogging them. Um, but they, yeah, uh, good luck at buying them. I know they've been back ordered for a while. Anthony, I'm not sure if you have any insight on, on how far out. Uh, so we probably ordered ours about a month ago and we were told that we are next in line, whenever that is. Yeah, Matt. same thing from Max, yep. Yeah, Max just said UT Austin placed an order in March and they still don't have them. Um, so that is something that if you are able to place that order now, it might be good to, you know, one, if your fiscal year hasn't ended yet, get it in now if you're able to make that purchase because one, who knows what budgets are going to look like next year and, and two, it's going to take a while for them to get there. Um, so when Robert Simmels was told about 10 weeks when they were quoted out, when was that? Was that recently or was that a little while ago? Last week. Okay. So we're looking at the end of the summer right now, pretty much, um, for a lot of places. 
uh, a good creative solution. Uh, Anthony, the garden, like the plant pump sprayers are a good backup. That's a good idea. Just make sure you have those EPA list N disinfectants in there um, for use. All yeah, right. That's, that's what we've been using for years, actually, just for our cleaning. We, you know, yeah, we've been doing a lot of deep cleaning usually every year, just around flu season anyway, because we get decimated by the flu, it seems like every year. And we've been using those with our Virex, but we make sure that it's you know, properly marked and um, they do make a good backup. So I can vouch for that. <laughs> All right, if, if anyone has any more questions about facilities, feel free to throw them in the or, chat no. or, or or speak up. Um, I think it might be good to move to competitive sports and, you know, some creative solutions about finance or Chris, do you have something? I have one question that was for facilities. that was just pop, uh, popped through that I thought I, we didn't touch on. Uh, Lindsay had a question, uh, thoughts on vinyl floor covering and rubber flooring being put down on gym floors for selectorized equipment. So does anybody have anything they could answer, or if Lindsay wants to just unmute, come on and ask that question. Maybe I'm not asking 100% right. No, you're correct. We're just looking at moving our fitness equipment into the gym, uh, but want to make sure that our wooden floor is safe. Anybody? Uh, looks like. Uh, Sean Adelphi says they're doing that. They have some extra flooring from an old project, so they're protecting their wood floors with that. Um, so it does sound like there are some folks doing that. Um, I know, like I said, I think you want to be really careful with that. You know, wood floors just and, and heavy machines don't work very well together, but uh, I think it's doable. Uh, it's probably best to talk to your facilities folks, see what kind of floor you have and what kind of subfloors you have as well. Concrete concourse around the courts as a backup plan. That's kind of the situation that we have. We, we're moving some of our strength conditioning areas to an old track that circles some of our uh, basketball courts. Uh, you know, so we've got a space. And actually, it's, 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 we have experience with that when we did our renovation project in 2012. That's where we had our strength and conditioning area for our varsity athletes anyway. So we already know the kind, you know, kind of the layout. We're just going to have to make it a little bit more socially distanced than what we already had. So... Yeah, that, that was an option for us. All right, feel free to throw any more questions about whatever you have. Um, I see Jeremy put a competitive sports question in the chat. Thank you for that segue, Jeremy. Um, for sport clubs, has anyone been thinking about what to charge for dues? Clubs need to make budgets, but it is ethical to charge full due. Is it ethical to charge full dues if they can't participate in the fall? That's a great question. Um, anyone thought about that in terms of I, I don't want to speak specifically to club dues but um we've been having discussions about student fees in general here and if we're remote like is it fair to charge uh the full fee and we are not going to i mean we did the same thing for our orientation we have a small orientation fee that got cut in half just because we're doing a remote orientation and we're going to follow suit with our student fees um because we're still going to program um but it's obviously not going to be the same you know span that we typically do. Um, so we're, I think we're doing about like a 50% student activity fee, which will have a big impact on what we can do. Um, but I'm assuming that might be a good way to transition that over to club dues. Um, one thing that we talked about on the, the region one uh, leadership call yesterday was having conversations with schools around you. So, um, and this is gonna get tied back in a second. So just bear with me for, for a minute. Um, if you are overseeing club sports, have conversations with directors or coordinators of club sports um, in universities nearby or in the same leagues as you so that you guys can all be on the same page um, and kind of have a unified front because you don't want to have your students be paying for, you know, league fees that they aren't going to have the dues to pay for. Um, so make sure that everyone's on the same page and that you aren't getting left out or getting charged when other schools aren't because they spoke up. Um, that's just a recommendation um, kind of related to this, but definitely be in contact with other people. Yeah, we actually, um, for all the schools in Virginia, there was about 17 of us um, that kind of oversee sport clubs. We all had a call last week and that was kind of what we talked about is, just trying to figure out like from a unified front on like where do we stand kind of as a whole within the state 
Um, so obviously, like depending on what the, the governor says we can and cannot do and what the university presidents, but just so that way, yeah, we're kind of like unified. And I mean, we were even talking about like, depending on where, where we're at come September, but maybe we limit sport club travel to just within the state of Virginia um, or, or whatnot, or not allowing schools from outside of the state to kind of come onto our campuses and players trying to figure out some, some creative solutions as far as like from the travel aspect for sport clubs. Um, but that was a big topic that we really talked about for a while. Um, Max had a question kind of jumping in on that, uh, talking, uh, asking, is anyone an institution where a student budget committee completely funds your club sports and dues are not an expectation? I can expand on that a little bit more. Um, yeah. So our student fee, like basically the student fee is put in the one pot and then um, managed by our student budget committee. Um, so whatever $400 each student pays times 1600, um, the student budget committee, uh, oversees and then, um, like sort of allocates to clubs on a yearly basis. And then there's an emergency fund that's available for organizations. If there's something that comes up, that's not in their expected budget. Um, so I mean, clubs are getting five, six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen $15,000 from the school. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess if they're, I know this, this spring, um, all club budgets were suspended uh, or frozen, and then all that money was sort of put into the student emergency fund at our institution. Um, so just seeing if anybody else is in that boat. I know um, one person, uh, Matt Grimm's reached out to me, uh, but if anybody else is, feel free to, to reach out. I think ours is a little bit like that i'm not 100 percent sure i'll actually have our um shoot me your email address and i'll have our club sports person reach out to you about how she's handling club sports budgets for this fall perfect Thanks, Jeremy, for throwing that in there. Uh, Matt had a question in there. Does any school model what club teams do based on the NCAA teams um, do? Yep, we are D2 and we are doing the same thing. Um, so even if we're on campus and for some reason um, we are uh, NCAA programs can't run, then club sports aren't going to run either. Is that kind of what you were getting at, Matt, or do you want to, do you mind expanding a little bit? No, I can expand a little bit. Um, I guess where I'm coming from, you know, NCAA Division Three last week brought down that they were uh, decreasing the minimum number of contests for the for this year by 33 percent. So again, like I'm sure if it came up and uh, you know, like all of our NCAA teams do it, then our club teams would have to do it as well. I feel like we're all all in a position where we have to try to read the tea leaves. I feel like there's a lot of Division Three schools that are trying to make the push of like conference only play and maybe just a couple more games than that if uh if that you know gets them to their minimum so again i'm just interested to see how many people are in that boat max is um is anybody else can I just bring something from um, the sport clubs roundtable, the this past sport clubs roundtable, um, to the group for anybody who manages club sports? Yeah, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so there was um, the folks who were managing this the sport clubs roundtable. Um, they were putting together a, a group of collegiate professionals to reach out to the national governing bodies for um, collegiate club sports, asking um, if they've made a plan for the fall. If they haven't, what are they waiting on? Um, what resources are they putting together for our students? Um, do they have interest in putting together a webinar or a Zoom call with pro athletes in that specific sport, catering that to collegiate club sport uh, student athletes just to sort of continue the community and get people involved? Um, so a lot of us as like reps for that, like we volunteer for this, um, 
just started reaching out to national governing bodies today um, for that information. So more, I, I would say within the next few weeks, the folks who are putting together this information will have that and will, I'm sure, post it in the uh, Parasite Connect. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Max. Uh, do you mind just saying, like, if if people want to be a part of that or get that information or hear from that, where can they find the results? Uh, I assume that the results will be posted in the NERSA Connect. Um, we, as a, there were, I mean, I'm sure there were at least 50 that uh, sort of responded of interest to reach out to the national governing bodies. We came up with a list of 52 different national governing bodies. Um, so once that's compiled, I think it's, um, Sarah Hawkins in California, Chad Zimmerman, um, and a third who I can't remember their name, um, are compiling this information and then, um, I believe we'll be sharing it through the NERSA Connect. Awesome. Thank you. Jeremy put in the chat that, uh, they are also going to be following whatever guidelines NCA puts out for their rec program. Um, Robert, do you mind coming off uh, mute and asking that question to the, to the group and see what we can get? Yeah, um, so we are watching what NCAA is doing more from the, if they aren't going, it gives us, we have our answer, but we also are working with our registered student organizations because all our sport clubs have to register that way as well. So we don't necessarily know what the restrictions are put on them. So if they have a, can only have 10 people for a meeting situation, how does that affect what we can do with sport clubs? Because we kind of fall in this weird, we are registered to organizations, but we have these other actually more risk management qualifications that we make them do. So what have other schools thought about with that? Or if there are, more restrictions for those organizations that mean that sport clubs really can't participate like they normally would. Uh, all right, we got some resources getting shared in the in the chat there. Uh, NCA article, it looks like. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really great article. Uh, we've been passing that one around in our department as we you know, look at resocializing college sports on our campus. Does anyone have anything to add to any of the questions that have come up or points or have any other questions that we can maybe talk about for the last 10, 15 minutes? Chris, do you have any questions that you need answered about Boy. this, about life? Questions I need answered about life. I don't know if we've got enough time for questions I need answered about life. That, uh, <clears throat> that, could, that could take a long time. I don't know if you guys are qualified to be my therapist. So That's a good point. Um, <laughs> we can avoid that for now, I think, for everyone's sanity. Um, the answer is 42. That's a good, good point, 42. Mark. It's always 42. Um, we'll give it a couple, like a minute or so, but if, if no one has any of their questions, um, we might be done for today. Um, uh, but again, we, thank you for coming for this and hopefully we can help you out with, with something. Hopefully you're going to walk away with some kind of resource that you didn't have before. Um, Chris, do you have anything to add? No, I would always just say, just check the small programs connect uh, page. If you aren't already connected to that, you know, we've been passing a lot of good resources around through that. You know, it's been actually a pretty vibrant community over the last year. So, you know, if you're not, uh, if you're not on that, uh, get that, you know, get, get on that and you know, make sure that you're getting that every day in your inbox. Um, Mark asked, quite, well, what is one thing that is keeping people up awake at night? I think, you know, as you're thinking about reopening or whatever the fall is going to look like, that's actually a really good question to think about. What's keeping you awake at night? Um, I mean, for me to answer that question personally, it, it's staffing. I mean, you know, especially on my campus, we pay all of our student positions the same amount of money, no matter where you work, what you do. How am I going to be able to, you know, recruit a kid to say, okay, you have to have all these certifications. You're going to be a first responder. There is, 
you know, you know, chances of coming into contact with this, but I'm going to pay you the same as what you would pay to get, you know, to work at the library. So. Uh, for me, my immediate response was Mark's impression of a gorilla that I got to see this past summer, about a year ago now. That keeps me up at night. <laughs> well, there is that as well. Yes, people defending Mark, so that's that's good. It, it is a great impression. It's good, but it'll keep you awake at night. It's scary good. That's that's why it keeps me up at night. All right. Um, well, anything else for anyone? No, that's it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Like I said, hopefully you got something from this. I know we got a lot. Um, look out for some thing. You know, more roundtables coming check out live in motion this should be uploaded by tomorrow afternoon at the latest i know they've been really good about getting these out chris do you have any closing thoughts no i you know just you know continue to stay positive continue to stay safe um you know as we all start to reopen and we're all in different phases of reopening our cities our states and the country um you know stay positive about this you know we're going to learn a lot from this and we're all going to come out of this a lot stronger uh and more informed than we were when we started and, you know, being able to make better decisions when, you know, crises like this come up in the future. Cause it's not an if, you know, that's kind of the motto I use with my student employees. You know, when we're talking about risk management, it's not an if something's going to happen, it's a when. So when the next pandemic or when the next you know, stressful situation comes up, hopefully we've kind of made ourselves a little more resilient for the future. So stay positive, reach out if you have questions. We're always more than willing to help, you know, help and answer those as well.